Good to see you, Judge. Evidently, there, there's no animal abuse laws. <laughs> <laughs> you sound like my daughters on that score, Senator. Uh, you know, I wanted to get to some questions, but first I want to talk about uh, Trans Am trucking because uh, Senator Durbin brought it up and Senator Lee brought it up. And I, I, I want to just go through the facts real quickly because I'm, I, I understand the reasoning behind your dissent, but I'm actually kind of puzzled by it as well. Uh, okay, so uh, Alphonse Madden is a truck driver. He's uh, made a stop off the interstate at 11 p.m. He comes back on, or he's about to come back on, notices his brakes are frozen on his trailer. Okay, so he decides, I'm not going to go on. It's dangerous to go with, with frozen brakes onto the interstate, uh, frozen brakes on my long trailer. He's in the cab, and he calls in uh, for, who's love the side, calls in for a repair. Uh, gets to dispatcher, dispatcher says, well, uh, you know, wait, hang on there, we'll, we'll wait for it. Okay, a couple hours goes by, the, the, the heater is not working in his cab, it's 14 below zero, 14 below zero. He calls in and he says, my feet, I can't feel them. I can't feel my feet, my torso, I'm beginning not to be able to feel my torso. And they say, hang on, hang on, wait for us. Okay, now he f actually falls asleep. And at 1.18 a.m., his cousin, I think, cousin calls him and wakes him up. And his cousin says that he is slurring his speech and he doesn't make much sense. Now, Mayo Clinic in Minnesota says that is uh, uh, hypothermia. And he had fallen asleep. If you fall asleep waiting under 14 below zero weather, you can freeze to death. You can die. He calls them back, and the supervisor says, wait. You got to wait. So he has a couple choices here. Wait or take the trailer out with the frozen brakes onto the interstate. Now, when those brakes are locked and you're pulling that load on a trailer with its brakes locked, you can go maybe, what, 10, 15 miles an hour? Now, what's that like on an interstate? Say you're going 75 miles an hour. Someone's going 75 miles an hour. They come over a hill and slam into that trailer. Also, he's got hypothermia. He's a little woozy. Probably figures that's not too safe. I don't think you'd want to be on the road with him, would you, Judge? Senator, um... Uh, uh, you would? I, or not? I, I, it's, a, I, it's a really easy yes or no. Would, I want would to you like the, to be on the road I with him? want to be on the road with him? Yeah. Uh, with the hitched trailer or the unhitched trailer, Senator? Well, either, but especially well, with the hitched trailer, with the locked brakes. No, I, I don't think that okay, was a option. Okay, I thought option. that was, I, I wouldn't yeah. want to be there either. Uh, yeah. And An so what he trailer. does is he unhitches it right. and goes off in the cab. And then I believe he comes back 15 minutes later. And he comes back after he gets warm so that he can be there when it gets repaired. Right. Okay, he gets fired. He gets fired. And the rest of the judges all go, that's ridiculous. He shouldn't, you can't fire a guy for doing that. It was, it was, there were two safety issues here. One, the possibility of freezing to death or driving with that rig in a very, very undangerous, very dangerous way. Which would you have chosen? Which would you have done, Judge? Oh, Senator, I don't know what I would have done if I were in his shoes, and I don't blame him at all for a moment for doing what he did do. Um, but, I, but, I empathize but, with him entirely. Okay, just, you've, we've been talking about this case. Don't, you, don't, you haven't decided what you would have done? You haven't thought about for a second oh, what you would have done in Senator, his case? I, I thought a lot about this case. Because and I, what would you have done? I totally empathize and understand. I'm asking you a question. Please answer questions. Senator, I don't know. I wasn't in the man's you, shoes. But I understand you why you don't he know did. what you would have done. Okay, I, I tell you what I would have done. I would have done exactly what he did. Yeah, I understand. And I think everybody here would have done exactly what he did. 
And I think that's an easy answer. Frankly, I don't know why he had difficulty answering that. Okay, so you decide to write a thing in dissent. If you read your dissent, you don't say it was like sub-zero, you say it was cold out. The facts that you describe in your dissent are very minimal. But here's the, here's the law that, and you go to the language of the law, and you talk about that. I go to the law. A person may not discharge an employee who refuses to operate a vehicle because the employee has reasonable apprehension of serious injury to the employee or the public because of the vehicle's hazardous safety or security condition. That's the law. And you decided that they had the right to fire him, even though this law says you may not discharge an employee who refuses to operate a vehicle because he did operate the vehicle. Was that right? That's your... That's how you decided, right? That's the gist of it. Well, no. Is that how you decided? That's what you decided. Senator, right? I, I, there are a lot of more words in the opinions, both in, in the majority by my colleagues and in dissent, but that I, I'm happy to agree with you. That's the gist of it. Right. Well, that's what you've said. And I look, I'm not a lawyer, but I've been on this committee for about eight years, and I've paid some attention. So I know that what you're talking about here is the plain meaning rule. Here's what the rule means. When the plain meaning of a statute is clear on its face, when its meaning is obvious, courts have no business looking beyond the meaning to the statute's purpose. And that's what you used, right? That's what was argued to us by both sides, Senator. But that's what you, that's what you used. Yeah, the, both that's sides right. argued okay. that the plain meaning supported yeah. there and 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 you used it to come to your conclusion but both sides. but the plain meaning rule has an exception when using the plain meaning rule would create an absurd result courts should depart from the plain meaning. It is absurd to say this company is in its rights to fire him because he made the choice of possibly dying from freezing to death or causing other people to die possibly by driving an unsafe vehicle. That's absurd. Now, I had a career in identifying absurdity. <laughs> and I know it when I see it. And it makes me, you know, the, it makes me question your judgment. You stopped by my office a few weeks ago. I asked you about Merrick Garland. I had read somewhere that, you, that after you accept the nomination, it's been talked about, one of the first causes you calls you placed was to uh, just, uh, Chief Judge Garland. And you said to me, I think the world of Merrick Garland. And I asked you a couple times if you were bothered by the way the Senate treated Merrick Garland, who you clearly have a great deal of respect for. You said something to the effect of, Senator, I try to stay away from politics. Now, you'd been on the bench for 10 years, so that sounded fair to me, and I decided to leave well enough alone. And I moved on to another topic. But your relationship with politics came up again yesterday. Uh, my good colleague, Senator Lee, lamented the extent to which the confirmation process has become political and suggested that you and other nominees are not equipped to navigate that process because confirmation politics are, in his words, quote, still a little foreign to you, are still quite unfamiliar to you. But it turns out that's not really entirely accurate. After you were nominated, this committee made a formal request for documents relating to your previous nomination and to your time at the Department of Justice. This is standard procedure. Those documents include emails back and forth between former Bush administration officials and you in 2004, back before you joined 
that administration and the Neil Gorsuch in those emails seems to be very, very familiar with politics. The Neil Gorsuch in those emails was looking for a job. Here's a message you sent to Matt Schlapp, President Bush's political director. This was in November 2004, just after President Bush won re-election. Quote, I spent some time in Ohio working on the election. This is you. What a magnificent result for the country. For me personally, the experience was invigorating and a great deal of fun. Now, that doesn't sound like someone who steers clear of politics to me. You went on to write, quote, while I've spent considerable time trying to help the cause on a volunteer basis in various roles, I concluded that I'd really like to be a full-time full member of the team. You attach your resume, which describes in detail your work in support of political campaigns and candidates. Basically, you had worked on Republican political campaigns since 1976. Uh, you'd worked for Reagan, uh, Bush one, Bush two. Uh, you, you were cited for distinguished service to the United States Senate for work in support of President Bush's judicial nominees by the Senate Republican Conference which suggests that even the political aspects of confirming judicial nominees is something that you are not unfamiliar with. Now, when we met earlier, I asked you what you thought of the way Senator, Senate Republicans treated Merrick Garland, and rather than answer the question, you, you replied, I try to avoid politics. But here you are in 2004, pledging your allegiance to the cause and shopping around a resume touting your work on political campaigns dating back to 1976. These messages establish that for a good deal of your prior career, you didn't avoid politics, quite the contrary. You were very politically active. So in light of that, I'd like to ask my question again. Do you think Merrick Garland was treated fairly by the United States Senate? Senator, a couple of things in response to that, if I might. Going back, uh, the absurdity doctrine argument was never presented to the court, and it usually applies in cases where there's a Scrivener's error, not when we just disagree with the policy of the statute. So I appreciate the opportunity to respond there. When there is a Scrivener there. Scrivener's error. Error. Error, Okay, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, not when we just disagree with the policy. Uh, with respect to Well, if I read my statutory interpretation, from, uh, let's see, this is from the uh, Notre Dame Law School, National Institute for Trial Advocacy. This is a pretty well-known exception oh, yeah. to the plain meaning rule, and I think you can apply it without it. I mean, don't you think it's absurd that this man was put, given that choice and then fired for it? Don't you think that was absurd? Senator, my heart goes out to him. Okay, never mind. That's, my heart goes out. That, to, just, but it's just but, not my job to write that. How do you think Merrick Garland was treated by the Republicans? Senator, since I became a judge 10 years ago, I have a canon of ethics that precludes me from getting involved in any way, shape, or form in politics. The I reason why judges don't clap at the State of the Union and why I can't even attend a political caucus in my home state to register a vote in the equivalent of a primary. Okay, but I don't think that this is a is you have to state your political views. That's not what this is about. How a Supreme Court justice who is nominated by the President of the United States this is like in the Constitution. I think you're allowed to talk about what happened to the last guy who was nominated in your position. You're allowed to say something without being about getting involved in politics. You can express an opinion on this. Senator, I appreciate the invitation, but I know the other side has their views of this, and you, your side has your views of it. That, by definition, is politics. Okay. okay. And, and, and Senator, judges have to stay outside of politics. I think the world of Merrick Garland, I think he's an outstanding judge. Okay, I understand. I've told you what I think. I understand. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but you know we have time. Uh, I think it's really important for us to understand how your political work and your political views might inform the views of the law. And I know this, your I, I don't hold it against you that you did political work. Lots, uh, lots of people did. 
1976, I was walking the district with my mom. Yeah. When she now, wanted for state house. Looking again at the emails, five or so months after your message to Mr. Schlapp, you emailed Ken Melman. Mr. Melman was your law school roommate, and at the time you emailed him, he was chairman of the Republican National Committee. You just interviewed for a job at the Department of Justice, and you wanted him to put in a good word, so he did. Mr. Mel Melman emailed the White House, and he wrote, Neil is a wonderful guy, was my law school roommate, did 72 hour, the 72-hour effort in Ohio for us, and was part of Lawyers for Bush. Mr. Melman wrote, quote, he is a true loyalist. Now, again, being politically active or a loyal Republican are not disqualifying characteristics for a Supreme Court nominee, not in my book anyway. But let's think back to the 2004 election. Let's look at Ohio, where you volunteered. Ohio is one of 11 states in 2004 where Republicans working to support the reelection campaign also worked to put anti-gay marriage amendments on the ballot. These state constitutional amendments passed, all 11 of them. The text varied state by state, but generally the amendments defined marriage as being between a man and a woman. The amendments sent a clear message to lesbian and gay couples that their unions were not equal in the eyes of the law. Now, you were a campaign worker in Ohio. You'll remember the group Lawyers for Bush Cheney. As a lawyer and as a student of the Constitution, how did you feel about the right to marry being put to a popular vote? Senator, um, I don't recall any involvement in that issue during that campaign. I, I remember going to Ohio. Were you aware of that issue at all? Oh, certainly I was aware of it. And how did you feel about it? Well, Senator, my personal views, any revelation of my personal views about this matter would indicate to people how I might rule as a judge, mistakenly, but it might. Okay. And I have to be concerned about that. Um, these discriminatory amendments were part of a deliberate, uh, a deliberate uh, effort to drive up the turnout, and we know that because uh, we know that because your friend Ken Melman said so. Mr. Melman was interviewed by the Atlantic in 2010 and said that the Bush campaign had quote been working with the Republicans to make sure that anti-gay initiatives and referenda would appear on November ballots in 2004 and 2006 to help Republicans. Now, to be clear, there's nothing to suggest that you were involved in crafting that strategy, but at the time, this tactic received a lot of attention including in Ohio, where you worked on the campaign. It was a pr profound impact on people's lives. But a lot has changed. Since 2004, Mr. Melman announced publicly that he is gay for one. He also voiced regret about what happened. He apologized. He said, at a personal level, I wish I had spoken out against the effort. Uh, as I've been involved in the fight for marriage equality, one of the things I've learned is how many people were harmed by the campaigns in which I was involved. I apologize to them and tell them I'm sorry. That's a brave thing to say. It's hard to admit regret. Mr. Melman had a personal connection to the issue, to be sure, but our country has come a long way in a relatively short amount of time. A lot of folks have changed their view about marriage equalities. Republicans and Democrat alike. In the meantime, Supreme Court has settled this issue. Marriage equality is now the law of the land, so you shouldn't have any problem answering this question. How have your views of marriage equality changed, if at all, since the 2004 election? Senator, my personal views, if I were to begin speaking about my personal views on this subject, which every American has views on, would send a misleading signal to the American people that my it's personal... It's law. It is absolutely set of law. There's ongoing litigation about its impact and its application right now. And I cannot begin to share my personal views without suggesting mistakenly to okay, people... Okay, can I move on to something else? Well, if then? I might Thank finish, you. If I understand. I finish. You've given a version of this answer before, so I understand. I understand. I'd like to return to something I raised in my opening statement, and that's your view of administrative law. Standing before conservative activists gathered at CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Committee, President Trump's chief strategist, Steve Bannon, and his White House chief of staff, Reince Priebus, outlined the president's agenda. Two topics were featured prominently, deregulation and your nomination. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. Reince Priebus started by explaining why nominating you was so important for the president to do right out of the gate. He said, referring to your nomination, 
quote, number one, we're not talking about a change over a four-year period. We're talking about a change of potentially 40 years of law, number one. That's change of potentially 40 years of law. Change the law. You and your colleagues here have said the job of a judge is to follow the law. Even if he dislikes the results, you've said that. Not change the law or change 40 years of the law, but that's what Reince Priebus said this is about. When the White House Chief of Staff is talking to his friends at CPAC, he says the justice job, that your job is to change 40 years of law. Yet my colleagues and you say it's to follow the laws as written. Well, it can't be both. So which is it? Senator, it's to be a judge, to be fair, to follow the law, to apply it to the facts and circumstances of each case, and to live out my judicial oath on whichever court I serve on, whether it's the Tenth Circuit, where I've served for the last 10 years, okay. and okay. where my opinions have been unanimous 97% of the time, Senator. I've been in I, I understand, and, and again, you've given uh, many times this, that answer, so if you'll <laughs> indulge me. Uh, Mr. Priebus, I want to say your nomination was central to President Trump fulfilling his policy objectives. Quote, Neil Gorsuch represents a type of judge that has the vision of Donald Trump. And it, referring to your nomination, fulfills the promise that he made to all of you, speaking to the conservative activists gathered at CPAC. What do you think that Mr. Priebus was talking about? Was he suggesting that if confirmed, you would be positioned to shape the court's decisions for the next 40 years? Or was he suggesting you could reach back 40 years? Roe v. Wade turned 44 this year, and president has promised to nominate judges who would overturn Roe. Chevron is 33 years old. I think this is a legitimate question. Was Mr. Priebus suggesting that you go back and change 40 years or of settled law or have an effect on the law moving forward? Respectfully, Senator, Mr. Priebus doesn't speak for me and I don't speak for him. I don't appreciate it how pe when people characterize me, as I'm sure you don't appreciate it when people characterize you. I like to speak for myself. I am a judge. I am my own man. Okay, I just want to just, you know, we've had some talk about this. I don't think we're crazy <laughs> to think that the administration and Ryan's previous, I don't think he was lying. And it doesn't, doesn't it, are you comfortable with your nomination being described in such transactional terms? Senator, there's a lot about this process I'm uncomfortable with. A lot. But I'm not God. No one asked me to fix it. I'm here as a witness, trying to faithfully answer your questions as best I can, consistent with the constraints I have as a sitting judge. Here to answer questions about my qualifications okay. and my record. I got it. Um, well, I find it unsettling that the, that the administration is talking about, the chief of staff is talking about the Supreme Court that way. But I want to get back to the panel at CPAC. After Mr. Priebus discussed your nomination, Steve Bannon talked about the president's agenda. He described three priorities, and one of them was, quote, the deconstruction of the administrative state. Now, here's what Mr. Bannon meant by that. He said that regulation was a problem from his perspective. Quote, every business leader we've had in is saying not just taxes, but it is also regulation. He said that if you look at the president's appointees, quote, they were selected for a reason, and that is deconstruction. The way the progressive left runs is if they can't get it passed, they're just going to put in some sort of regulation in an agency. That's all going to be gonna, that's all gonna be deconstructed. Taking Steve Bannon at his word, do you think only cabinet appointees were selected to bring about this deconstruction? Or do you think the White House also sees a role here for its judicial nominees? Senator, respectfully, I believe that's a question best directed to Mr. Bannon. He's not here. I'm just quoting him, that's all. 
I think the White House does see judges as a part of this deconstruction. I think that they're seeing your nomination as an important step toward achieving this goal. You've shown a willingness to disregard agencies' interpretations of statutes. You did that in Trans Am Trucking with the Department of Labor regulation, for example. Uh, you've done in other cases as well. And in August, you wrote that concurrence to your own unanimous opinion in which you described Chevron, the Supreme Court's landmark administrative law case, as, quote, permitting executive bureaucracies to swallow huge amounts of core judicial and legislative power. You wrote, quote, maybe the time has come to face the behemoth. Now, generally speaking, as we've discussed, Chevron provides the courts uh, should defer to an agency's interpretation of the federal laws that is tasked that it is tasked with administering. When Congress passes laws that require agencies to implement them, say by issuing safety standards for children's toys or rules to ensure that pharmaceuticals or medicines are safe, those agencies turn to experts to develop those policies. Experts like scientists at the FDA, for example. I think that's a good thing. We want experts doing the work. What we senators don't want to be doing is deciding how much lead can be in your water or what the distance in, baby, in the slats are in a baby's crib. I don't trust Senator Coons to do that. Chevron provides that when agencies do that, courts should be wary of stepping in to overrule them without a good reason. This is Scalia's agrees with Chevron. But I'm concerned that this administration sees common sense, common sense health and safety rules as a burden on big business. And I'm concerned that they want to appoint pro-corporate judges who are willing to substitute their own judgment on these managers matters for those of experts. Do you believe that Chevron was wrongly decided? Senator, I'm a circuit judge. I don't tell my bosses what to do. I do, when I see a problem, raise my hand and tell my bosses I, I see an issue here. And I did in that case, not because of any big corporate interest, but because of what happened to Mr. Gutierrez, an undocumented immigrant to this country and the whipsaw that he was placed in by a change in law affected by an administrative agency, a bureaucracy, overruling a judicial precedent and telling him he now had to wait not 10 years out of the country, but 14, something like that. And, Senator, that's part of my job to, to say these things when I see problems like that. It's a due process problem I saw. And no one, Senator, is suggesting that scientists shouldn't get deference or chemists or biologists. Section 706 of the APA is quite clear that on facts, courts So you want to address this behemoth. And that suggests that the comments made by Mr. Priebus and Mr. Bannon know exactly what they, what you think about these issues. And I think some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle do as well. This is a big deal. During the entire 114th Congress, Chevron deference was mentioned only twice on the Senate floor. But between the announcement of your nomination on January 31st and last week, that decision was mentioned 30 times by four different senators. Each of those four senators discussed the case while speaking in support of your nomination. Three of those senators are members of this committee. So I know you're choosing your words very carefully, and I know you're trying not to signal how you might rule in certain cases, but I think some of those signals have already been sent. Thank you.